so while we get the uh, PowerPoint set up, I'm just going to introduce myself. I'm uh, Sharif Natu. Uh, I'm in, uh, I've been in real estate sales and property management for about 15 years now. And the number one question people love to ask me is, why do you want to deal with tenants? Like, what compels you to actually work with tenants? And the truth is that 10 years ago, I was in Dubai and I was selling pre-construction condos. And the only way I could make 16 sales in one shot is if I opened up a property management company. So I did that. I opened a property management company, going back to the hotel room and saying, I own this company and let's buy these 16 properties. So that's how I got into uh, the property management business. The truth is that none of those 16 people came to me for property management. And my first experience was one family that said to me, we'll give you our five properties, but you have to handle our first eviction. So 26 years old with a bunch of sheriffs and a dog trying to evict somebody, ready to bang the door down, open it up, and no one's inside. So great learning experience. <laughs> so my objective today, if you can switch the slide, is to talk to you more about investment property considerations, uh, choosing a good tenant, and your obligations as a landlord and your responsibilities, and then how to manage your property. <coughs> so the number one thing is, if you can switch the slide over, is, uh, is talking about your... Um, Property, investment property considerations. Sorry, if you can just switch the slide. So number one thing is, you know, before you look at a property, you want to fi first find out location. So where do you want to buy a property? A lot of people come to me today and say, you know what, I want to buy in Hamilton. And because Hamilton is cheap, and Hamilton, you can get a great return on investment. The truth is, now this is my personal opinion, is I don't want to deal with a Hamilton tenant. Because Hamilton's known to have the most delinquent tenants ever. The truth is, that some people have more success than others. So just be careful where you're buying in Hamilton if you're choosing Hamilton. But otherwise, I like to buy in my own backyard, okay? So which is Markham, Toronto, and all those areas. But before you before you buy a property, you know, first find out location. Where do you want to buy? Speak to a realtor. Understand um, the costs, the objectives, and determine your long-term goal. So when clients come to me and say, "I want to buy a property," the first thing I ask is, "How long do you want to hold?" So I have a lot of clients that say, oh, I want to buy a pre-construction condo because it's cheaper. When it's ready, I'm going to flip it and make a profit. The truth is you actually don't make a profit anymore in pre-construction condos unless you bought it 10 years ago. Today, if you were to buy a pre-construction condo, you have to wait till it's built, hold for three to five years, rent it out, and then you'd make a profit. So when I look at my, uh, my, my income statement and my scenarios, to break even on a property, essentially you have to hold it for three and a half years. Okay, so between three and a half to four years just to break even. The next year, you'll see a return of anywhere between 10 to 15% on your investment, on your initial deposit, okay? So understand what your goal is. Speculation, in my opinion, in my advice, is don't buy in speculation because you're going to lose money, okay? So be a sound investor. Everyone who's made money in real estate, Warren Buffett, the Gates family, Trump, everyone who's in real estate, they've all held long term. And my advice to you would be at least hold for five years. <clears throat> I look at condos and I say to you that condos are like buying a mutual fund. They're the safest investment property. If you buy in Toronto downtown, it's almost a recession-proof property. Understand that with condos, Airbnb is probably something that everybody's looking at doing in condos, but the truth is now with new legislation, condo boards are saying you can't rent out a property for less than six months. So you're stuck to a six-month lease. Now, if you're working with a real estate agent or if you're trying to rent out the property through a firm, you're going to have to pay like one month's rent. So taking a six month lease doesn't make sense. You want a minimum one year. In our experience, average tenant stays about 18 months in a property. Has that come to Markham too? Yes. So this is GTA. So all GTA now? Yes. The, Air, the Airbnb? Yeah, you have to do a six month lease. So every condo is different, but majority of condos do not allow. So the, condo, the rule is governed by the condo board. The rule for renting for Airbnb is, is, is governed by the condo board. So we're seeing most condo boards are saying no more than, no less than six months rental. Because there's a lot of ins and outs and condo owners who are buying property, they want ownership, like they want homeowners to be in there. <clears throat> what you'll find in the Toronto area, even in Markham, 50 to 60% of owners, are, uh, sorry, 60% of, of, uh, of uh, occupants are tenants. So in a brand new building, you'll see that number very high between 75 to 85%. After a, a building starts to transition, in the Markham area in the suburbs, you start to see more homeowners, and that number starts to go down to about 50 to 70% uh, homeowners. But downtown Toronto, you're looking at almost anywhere between 70% are tenants. And this is just an average based on what I've seen, okay? 
So when you're looking at condominiums, understand a couple of things. So I mentioned pre-construction before, but let's say, let's say you take resale. You have to take into account property taxes, your condo fees, um, and any other expenses. So hydro, if it's separate, usually separately submetered, the tenant usually pays for that. But you take this into account, and you run your numbers, and you'll find that in order for you to just break even on a condo investment, you have to put anywhere between 40 to 50% down payment in today's market value, right? Three years ago, it was around 30%, 35%. So if you think you can go buy a property with 5% down and break even, I don't know where you're going to find that property, but please tell me. <laughs> so when it comes to pre-construction condos, one thing that everybody forgets to understand is that you have an HST component to your purchase price. The only way you get a rebate back on that, and it's a rebate of a maximum of up to $24,000, is if you've rented the property out for a minimum of one year from the time of ownership, not occupancy. Big difference. So some condos you'll find occupancy is, is let's say today, but final closing is in four months from now, but you've rented it out today. But you have to wait till a full one year of final closing. And you, know, you can attest to that a little bit, <laughs> right? So. And then, so you take into, the fact, into account HST on a purchase, and then you take into account your closing costs, so about 1% to 2% to the builder, your lawyer fees, uh, and so forth. Your, your return has diminished a little bit. That's why you need to hold a property three to five years. Now, on average, condos have grown in value by 8%. Downtown is anywhere between 10 to 12%, but on average, in the whole GTA, you're looking at 8% return, uh, every increase in value. So in order to get to that break-even point, you got to wait or, or uh, profit, you gotta have to really wait the three to five years o of property ownership. Um, I have a question about that. Yeah. Is that still statement around 8% true given, given what we're hearing about the condo market being heated right now? So the condo market being heated, so I wanna, I wanna backtrack that. The last five years, the condo market sat flat and everybody thought the condo market had crashed and everybody went to houses and house, housing market went up drastically. Today you're seeing the housing market retract anywhere between five to 10% depending on the location, and you're seeing condos now increasing by 5% value month over month or on average about 10%. Location's key, right? So downtown Toronto today, if you're looking for a one bedroom condo, 450 square feet without parking, without locker, you're looking at $520,000, right? That will get your uh, will will rent for about two thousand to twenty two hundred dollars a month. So and location is really important because if you go on the on the west side or the east side, the return is a little bit different. So every condo is is, is different. Okay, how long how much longer will the condo market go up in value? We'll know next year. <laughs> right, your guess is as good as mine. But like Vinod said, property prices increase every year. Long, if, and that's why you have to hold it long term, you'll see property values increase year over year over year. Will there be a retraction? There's always a retraction in the market. Will it go down to what happened in the States? Depends on RBC if they decide to increase their rates drastically, right? So <laughs> please keep it down. <laughs> Let's move on to multi-res properties. A lot of people see gains in multi-residential properties. So for a long time, <clears throat> people avoided buying triplexes and duplexes. These are probably one of the best investment properties you can buy. The only thing you have to understand is there's a cash, in, a cash injection in, in here. You have to put in money to bring these properties back to, up to value. One thing I caution you for is if you're buying properties with basement apartments, and you'll see these on MLS listings, basement apartments there, but then in the broker remarks, these are the remarks you don't see as a consumer. It says seller does not warrant retrofit status of the basement. That means two things. One, it's not a legal basement, or two, they have no idea if it's a legal basement. If you're buying in Durham, which gives you the best bang for your buck today, it's easy for uh, your neighbor to complain about your basement tenant very easily, and the city comes in and shuts, off the, shuts you out very quickly. So they'll say, tenant, you have to move out. Uh, owner, we need permits. We need to see if you have a legal basement apartment. In the city of Toronto, and I'm, I'm, not, and I'm saying this without prejudice, it's a new term I've learned, <laughs> is that the city uh, inspector is not is turning a blind eye because there's a shortage of housing in the city of Toronto. So you can get away with it, but from a legal perspective, make sure it's legal. Check the zoning rights as well. Um, yeah. So and understand the pros and cons about that. So if we can move to the next slide. So what are tenants' responsibilities? This is a key question. Tenants almost have zero responsibility. We like them to keep the property clean. 
right? Inform the landlord of any repairs, and you'll get tenants that report every single repair from my appliance is not working, my floors are squeaking, my windows is leaking air. Um, and, and we we ideally want your tenants, and we, when we pick our tenants, we want to make sure that we find good tenants. We ideally want them to handle the small repairs. And small repairs meaning change your own light bulb, right? Clean the property, do your do the do the bathtub caulking. One of the major expenses we uh, we manage for our clients is caulking of tubs because they don't clean, and two our appliance repairs. If I can show you my work order sheet, I always have about thirty uh, appliance work orders. So when you're buying property. Try to buy a, a, a long uh, warranty, but the truth is that, let me explain to you the truth about the problem, problem with warranties. If your fridge damages, by the time you get somebody to come and repair your fridge, it's already five to seven days. Food's already spoiled. If you find a professional tenant, they're gonna ask for money on, the, on food. So just get a repairman in there, it's fixed within two, three days, okay? Um, if you don't mind moving to the next slide. Screening for tenants. So all your money as an investor, as a landlord, is in the how you screen your tenants. A lot of people, a lot of landlords I find are so are in such a rush to get their properties rented out because they don't want vacancy. And what happens is a couple of things, especially if you're in a brand new condominium building, is you're renting your property for really cheap and to increase that rental rate year over year, and after the new uh, uh, Fairness Act, you can only increase by the rental guidelines of 1.8% this year. In the past, you were able to bring it to market value. The only way you can bring it to market value is the tenant is leaving. But a lot of people rush to get a tenant in to start paying the, 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 the rent. I caution you on that because there's a lot of professional tenants out there, and there's a lot of professional agents out there, and there's a lot of scam artists out there. I process maybe about eight to 10 applications a month and I got to tell you I come across all sorts of false stuff so I'll give you an example we had a we had a uh, we have a property for rent uh, for a client and uh, an agent b gave me everything uh, credit bureau job letter um, references the application form and I said this is fantastic great credit scores and you automatically think 770 uh, credit score they're perfect so I said I want pay stubs so there was silence for a day and then I get a call back from the realtor. I said, so where's my pay stubs? He goes, well, there's a problem. The wife gets paid in cash and the husband gets paid in cash. Yes. So I turned and I said, I'm not taking your tenant. But there's good credit and there's, check the references and landlord. I said, in today's world that we live in, I want proof of income. So unless you can give me a, a T4, T5 slip, a notice of assessment or proof of income, I'm not looking at your application. So you really have to go through a thorough uh, screening process. Run a credit check. Now, you as a consumer don't have access to checking credit, so what typically I ask for from tenants is provide me with your Equifax report. Now, Equifax has two or three different product reports. Um, one of them, I forget the name of it, but it's cost $27 for them to, to pay for it, and it actually gives you the score in a full report. Time to time, I get people giving me the cheaper version where there's no score, and it's hard to understand because you can just base all your information, your judgment on the number, the score number, but you want to look at every single detail. What balance are they holding? Um, what are they owing? Like somebody who has like 10 credit cards, you start to wonder what their spending habits are. Delinquencies, the biggest delinquency I see is, is Rogers or Bell. It's always a modem that's gone missing or a phone bill that's gone missing or something about a phone that they don't want to pay. And for some reason, I don't know why consumers think this is okay to not pay a bill, but if you owe the money, pay it. Like simple, just pay it, right? But a lot of people, people just hate Bell and Rogers. They just hate bail and lodge, and they think they can get away with it. And, and tell me if I'm wrong, Alice, Susan. If you do credit, if you do mortgages, and you see people with bad credit, it's always a Rogers modem that's holding you back. It's always a Rogers modem, right? So for credit checks, there's an app called Neighborly, N-A-B-O-R-L-Y.com. You can ask them to fill out a whole application form, and it spits out a credit bureau, and they use Equifax and TransUnion. There's, there's a debate between which one's better, Equifax or TransUnion, and I know the banks have their own internal credit checks, so I know, does RBC have it? Because I know, yeah, they have your own, you can go check your own credit and all the other banks. So sometimes you'll see that, but you want to see details. The other important thing is take a, take a look at your background check. What's happening with the tenants? So everybody today is on Facebook. Who here is on Facebook? Come on, everybody here is on Facebook. <laughs> Facebook, Twitter, uh, Google+, Check their social profiles. You can tell a, a tenant's habit. You can't hold them to it, but you can at least check, Google their name, um, check their, uh, their, their background, see what you can find out. You know, 
they'll, they'll always have a list of references. The problem with references is everyone has a best friend. And the best friend always says good things about you, right? So tell me one friend that doesn't say anything good, anything good about you. Everybody will say something good about you. Employment references as well. You want to call the, employ the employment company? Always call the employment company. Never take the, take the word of a document. Call the company today. Ask them. Who, is this person employed? How long have they been there? And the person signing the letter, try to get a hold of them. Like when you're working with large companies like, like PwC and so forth, you're, it's going to be hard for you to get their, the HR department. Then that's why you ask for t um, uh, pay stubs because you can tell how it works, right? And if the person's actually making the money that they say they're making. You'll find very interesting things. You know, you'll have somebody that's, uh, that wants to rent a condo for $2,000, but they're only making $40,000 a year. How does that work, right? And some people say, well, I have savings. Well, <laughs> you know, you don't want to get a tenant that can't afford the place and they're out in three months or six months, okay? So a story about background check. We had a tenant that moved in um, that, that applied and had the best credit score, pay stub checked out, employment checked out, reference, everything checked out perfectly. Two months in, rent bounces. Call the tenant, I say, your rent bounce, you got to pay. No problem. Payments made right away. E transfers in, so this is fantastic. Next month, same thing happens. Payment comes in, no problem. Third month, okay. Fifteen days goes by. We've already sent a notice. So remember, send notices out right away. Do not wait for them to get back to you. Always, we we have a policy that right away, uh, rent is not paid. We we send a notice right away. Fifteen days later, right when it was like final day to to apply for for eviction, she pays. So I'm like, what's going on here? This is something, something's tricky here, and I don't like to be wrong. So, but I'm proven wrong a lot. But I don't like to be wrong in this situation. So I'm like, I go back to the application form. I start going through all everything. So I can't get a hold of the tenant the next month because it's late again. So I Google the phone number, find the phone number. Okay, this is fine. Don't have too much information. I Google the email address that that they had given me, that she had given me. Google the email address. It links to an ad on Kijiji, and it's selling gift cards. So this person is obviously struggling because they're selling gift cards to make way. Then I see a phone number attached to that gift card. I'm like, this is a whole different phone number. Google the phone number. It's an escort service. Aha, this makes sense. This is what's going on. So I was able to call her on her activity. Now, it's not illegal to be an escort. It's illegal to provide escort services in the condo, right? So right away, I call her realtor. I said, look, this is what I found out. This is what's going on. If I don't get rent, this is going to be ugly. So right away, comes up with a sad story saying, you know, I lost my job, blah, 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 blah. We took, we ended up taking her to tribunal because she was consistently late. We ended up winning, but she had to pay rent on time. If she's 10 minutes late, I have an order for eviction. If she's 10 minutes late, at, if she pays at one o, at, at, was it one o'clock, 101 AM, rights for, uh, for eviction. So you gotta really be on top of your paperwork. So make sure you check everything, do your background check. Um, Interviewing a tenant, you can't really interview a tenant, so you gotta be careful how you interview a tenant. Be be tactical, get them on the phone, just have a few conversations. But before I show any property, any any tenant a property, I ask them the following questions. So I'm gonna go through this really quickly with you. This, this might help you as well. Where's my list? It's not here. So here's a list of questions you can ask the references. How long did this person live in the rental space? Uh, when did he, she or rent from you? This, this is not in there. You can always call me or email me, and I'm happy to give you these questions. Did they have any pets? Uh, did the tenant cause any damage beyond normal wear and tear? Was the tenant generally respectful of you and your property? Did any of the tenants issue complaints about him or her? Uh, did the tenant give you proper notice to end tenancy? And would you rent to this tenant again? So these are just some of the questions you can ask the references. Um, I'm just looking for my question list of what I typically ask tenants. So here, here are the questions you want to ask a tenant before you show them the property. So people are typically in the habit of, oh, I want to see the property. Can I see it at 10 o'clock tomorrow? And you're like, yeah, 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 this is a potential tenant. But you haven't asked the qualifying question. So here are really good questions. One is, are you aware that will be that you will require first and, that we will require first and last month's rent, and will this be an issue? 
you, you'll be surprised how many people don't know they have to give first and last month's rent that they think they can give it on the day of uh, of the the rental period commencement of the rental period you want first and last month's rent right away legally you can only ask for last month's rent just so you know that why are you moving when are you looking to move are you a smoker how long do you intend to rent the property for do you have any pets have you ever been evicted how many people will be living in the apartment do you have any other questions for me do you know the hydro may be included these are some of the questions one of the questions I like to ask every single tenant is do you have a criminal record right and then by law you're not allowed to do a, a criminal record uh, 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 check but you can ask them as long as you ask every single tenant that question and you'd be surprised how many people walk away from the application like they just won't respond I've had some can they, lie? they can lie about anything <laughs> people are, people are liars yeah, it's human nature, right? <laughs> right. So people lie about everything. The only thing is, you by you asking questions, the more questions you ask somebody, it just puts them in a position to either a answer it or not to answer it. And so the question more though is if they say no, and then you find out later, right? You you don't have any legal recourse as long as they pay rent. So I we have a property that we rented out to somebody who had who was reported for mortgage fraud. But he was able to pay the rent. Now, we've never had a problem with him. He's actually a fantastic tenant. If there's a problem with the property, he fixes everything. Doesn't even come to us for anything. But he was reported as a mortgage fraudster, right? How long does it actually take you to get one of these tenants out of this? Good question. I've been told like, it can take minimum. Like, I mean, for your best case scenario, is probably nine months. That's well, if you have a professional tenant, I'm actually going to talk about that. So if you can go to the next slide. So, potential reasons to evict a tenant. So these are the, the reasons that you'd see why you're evicting tenants. Non-payment of rent, persistent late payments, illegal activities, interfering with others or overcrowding, and undue damage. So to answer your question about how long does it take to evict a tenant. So let's say for non-payment of rent. So they didn't pay their rent on the first of the month. Immediately you have to send them a notice, okay? And it has to be the notice from the landlord and tenant board, not your email, not a letter, not a text message. It has to be the form that the board uses. They then have 15 days to pay the rent. So they don't have to pay the rent until 15 days. Failing to which, then you have to go to the board, file an application, an L1, to see them at tribunal. That's another two or three weeks before you get to tribunal. So they still have all that time to pay the rent and you can't force them out of the property. So now you're two months into the process. You get to tribunal and so we as property managers cannot represent the consumer, the client, as, uh, as a paralegal, you have to hire your own paralegal or you represent yourself, okay? So that's how it works with property management firms. So if you're hiring a property management firm, they say they're gonna represent you, it's not true. They have to have an arm's length paralegal or you can represent yourself, okay? By the time you get there, you're two months in and typically what happens then is the, the adjudicator will turn around and say, we're gonna give the tenant two months or three months to pay the rent. Now you're four months in, right? So it could take anywhere between two to six months to evict a tenant. Nine months is possible. It depends how you've logged your, your, your is issues with, with the tenant. The nine month situation usually happens with a professional tenant if you don't record things properly, if you don't take uh, measures right away. So it's really important to do that. And you hear like scary stories on, uh, uh, in the news. If you really wanna see how it works, go to a tribunal, spend a day, it's, it's a rodeo. It's honestly like, it's just, it's a joke. It's a joke what happens. So persistent late payments. So you typically think, okay, you're late for pay, uh, rent twice. You can kick out the tenant. You have to wait almost six months of reporting. So six months of actual notices that the N4s that they've been late, at least one or two applications to prove that they've been persistently late for tenant. The law is on the tenant side. So when the Landlord and Tenant Act came into enactment, it was during the NDP government. Okay, not to get into politics, but that's what happened. And they created this law to protect the tenants because as soon as you become an investor in, the, in Canada, as soon as you own one other property, you're considered rich. <laughs> Simple, right? So you're taxed heavily on, on all sorts of things. Illegal activities. So we talked about the escort services. So as long as there's no services inside the property, it's not illegal. Um, but for example, condominiums, you can't run a business in a condo. 
So we had one tenant that was doing a lot of buying and selling of cell phones. So that was an illegal activity. The board got upset. They said that's an, a notice that they're going to take uh, the take uh, the owner to um, uh, to court. We had to s give an N5 notice to the tenants. They had to stop all their legal activities. What ended up happening is they ended up moving out, right? Interfering with others and overcrowding. Overcrowding is an interesting situation because, according to the Human Rights Code, you're allowed to have you're allowed to house one person per every 100 square feet. So if you have a 600 square foot one bedroom condo, legally, in according to the Human Rights Code, you're allowed to have six people. But according to the condominium rules, you only allow two people per bedroom, right? So if you have a third person, a fourth person, which you typically see when students are renting, I don't like student rentals. That's a personal opinion. When tenants come, when I get, especially for downtown condos, a lot of student rentals, right, come in to, to rent properties. I gotta tell, I gotta warn you. As long as you're okay with damages every single year and you expect expect to pay uh, four thousand uh, dollars or five thousand dollars, you have to replace the floors. The walls get damaged, but you have to, you know. In our experience, I like MBA students. I like graduate students. They're the best. But there's a lot of young students, and um, we have a lot of foreign students that come in at the age of 16, 17, coming to get their their grades up so they can go to like prep schools. I caution you. A lot of this is also, a lot of uh, tenants will provide one year's rent up front. Legally, you're not allowed to accept one year's rent up front. It's a big no-no. It's just, it's just a big no-no. Do people take it? All the time, right? But just note, for your, note to self, it's illegal. So the tenant can easily give you the money. On that same day, go to the landlord and tenant board, file an application against you that you took all their money. Okay? So, and that's a $10,000 fine for you. So I caution you on that, okay? Everything you do wrong as a landlord for 10 years, they can come after you and the minimum fine is $10,000. So remember that. We have a, a, a property that we manage right now. The tenant abandoned the place. Like it's already eight months in, they're not there, they're behind on their hydro bills. And my client's saying, we rent it. I'm like I'm not taking that responsibility. He's like, no, I'm telling you we rent it. I said, you sign a waiver and I'll re-rent it. Otherwise, you're up for a $10,000 fine. You have, when there's an abandoned property, there's a whole process. You actually have to file to the tribunal, an application, show up, they have to check. It's, it's, it's interesting. I want to go to the next slides. So damage is very simple. So um, we talked about the eviction process. What are your duties as a landlord? So as a landlord, you must provide a safe place. It has to be um, in accordance to all the fire regulations, to so smoke alarms in, in houses. You have to have a smoke and carbon monoxide detector on every single floor. Condos, you don't need a carbon monoxide detector, but you need a smoke detector. Um, heating must be working. All wiring, plumbing work must be good. The structure of the building must be maintained. Your fridge and stove must work. Not your dishwasher, not your washer and dryer. Right? So fridge and stove must work at all times. Common areas must be clean. Um, can you just go to, the, to my next slide or then come back if I need you to? Okay, I'll get to that in a second, but if you can just go back. So as a landlord, a lot, of a lot of landlords call me and say, I want you to go and inspect the property every single month. We can't do that. You can't, you, it's not that there's a law saying you can do that, but you can't do that because if the tenant thinks you're harassing, they can file for harassment and you can be fined up to $2,500 for every instant you show up at the property. So we typically like to do inspections on our properties every six to eight months, and we provide our clients with a full detailed report. When we have tenants that are long term, we don't disturb them. We, we just do a quick check in. Typically, we're in there for some kind of repair so we know what's going on with the property. Um, when you're selling your property, here's an interesting thing. If your tenant gives you notice that they want to leave the property, you do not have to give them 24 hours notice. But if you're giving them notice that you want to sell the property, you have to give them 24 hours notice. This argument is going to go back and forth a thousand times. So I would just say give them 24 hours notice, show the property. You can only show the property between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m., no later. The agents don't understand this concept. You have to leave by 8, 8 p.m., otherwise they can file an application against you and you get fined as the owner. So if you have a realtor that's selling your investment property, stop showing at 7.30. Do not let anybody see the property after 7.30 because it's a matter of time before tenants understand their rules, their laws and ob obligations. Um, you cannot give a tenant notice to, rem to leave the property because you want to sell the property. You have, to, you, have, you have had to have the property sold 
then give them notice. So when we see, sell properties, we always say 60 days notice. The truth is you have to give 61 days notice. I've had a situation where closing was at 5 p.m., but the tenancy ran to 11.59. And, it, and the tenant was a lawyer, so guess what he did? He stayed to 11.59. And it was, it, it, it just, we had to delay closing by one extra day. So this is how we learned these lessons by trial and error. So just so you know that when you're selling your property, 61 days, and remember that the tenancy, if it starts on the 1st and goes to the 30th, and you sell the property on the 15th, and that's your closing date, no, go to the next month, okay? Um, I know you probably have a lot of questions, but no one's asking. <laughs> uh, landlord's actions that are prohibited. I'm going to just read this really quickly for you. A landlord cannot interfere with the supply of vital services to the tenant. If heat goes, you must supply heat. Just because they didn't pay their, their hydro bills, you still have to supply water and heat to the property. So that becomes your responsibility. Okay? There's a fine line. You know how we like to say tenants, um, you pay your own utilities. There's a fine line there where the tri tribunal can turn around and say, you cannot evict the tenant because they haven't paid their utilities. Okay, so be careful about that. With, th with, with respect to air conditioner, I think the, the hottest temperature that you're allowed to have a property is 27 degrees. Okay, any condo investors here? Anyone own condos? While it's vacant, keep the AC and heat on. I've seen a lot of units flood because of no heat or because it's too hot and the floors have wilted. Um, a landlord is prohibited from interfering with the tenant's reasonable enjoyment of the unit or property. A uh, landlord is prohibited from harassing, obstructing, coercing, or threatening the tenant. Uh, you cannot issue eviction notice to the tenant and forcing them out for any untrue reasons. When we rent our property, it's always a minimum of one year lease. The law says you cannot hold the tenant liable to a one year lease. It is a contract term, so the tenant has a right to assign his lease to somebody else. You cannot withhold that from that person. So if the tenant wants to leave after three months, they can leave, but they have to assign it. They can't just leave, and you can't, uh, you can't say, no, you can't leave the premises, okay? Um, because it's a one-year term, it doesn't mean that your lease terminates automatically. A lease is forever, and it, you, you're not obligated to, to hold the tenant liable for another one-year lease. They can go on a month-to-month -month basis, but they still have to give you 60 days notice that they're moving out, okay? Um, last month's rent collected on a, you know when you collect first and last month's rent? The last month's rent is always held as last month's rent until they leave and they can leave in 20 years. You have to pay interest every single year on that deposit based on the guideline uh, rate. So if it's 1.8%, you have to give them 1.8% on the deposit. If you do not give the interest on the deposit, the tenant can come to you at 9 years and 11 months and say, I want my deposit interest plus interest on what you haven't paid in 9.5 years. <laughs> okay, so pay that $27 out, it's worth it. <laughs> um, how am I doing for time? Do you want me to bore you? Okay, most important question everybody asks, tenants and pets. Pets have more rights than human beings today, okay? You can deny a tenant to move into your property because they have a pet, but you cannot kick them out once they brought the pet in the next day. So. Uh, my friend over there that was sitting was asking about tenants lying. Tenants always lie about pets. There you are. Tenants always lie about pets. They never have a pet until they move in. <laughs> Somehow, some way, they're taking care of their mother's dog. Okay? You can, and you cannot kick out their, them because of, of a pet. Our application form always asks if they have a pet. And if they don't have a pet, because we want to tell that we, want to, we can use it as you lied to us. Right? The other thing is that you, when you do the reference check, you always ask the landlord, do they have a pet? Okay, most pet owners are very good with their dogs. They don't really cause damage. It's the new puppies. It's the people in Liberty Village. It's the young and hip people that don't take care of the dogs and get a brand new dog. And they always love to chew your baseboard. Dogs are better than cats. If you're a cat person, I'm sorry, I don't like cats. <laughs> um, landlord insurance. It surprises me how many landlords don't have insurance. It's the cheapest investment you can make but a lot of owners don't have insurance. If you are a condo owner, understand that there could be a flood every single day on your property and your floors will get damaged, your beautiful wood floors, the condo corp will never cover it and nor will your insurance. So hardwood floors, laminate flooring, doesn't matter how the builder has sold it to you, it's considered an upgrade. One leak, 
you're replacing that floor every single time. I had a client had three leaks in that property in a span of three months. He was responsible for replacing wood, uh, uh, the wood flooring. The buildings, condo building's responsibility is to give you back carpet. Okay, so make sure you have adequate insurance. There's also a landlord, uh, a tenant insurance component in here. You're not responsible if there's a fire. You're not responsible for the tenant's content, but you are responsible for building back that unit and supplying the property back to the tenant for the same rent if they choose to come back. Okay, um, that's all for landlord insurance. So I can go to my next slide. So I'm almost done my presentation. If you have any questions or thoughts, please let me know. Question. Yeah. So you 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 cannot deny based on a on a somebody's career or income and so forth. But the number one thing is I look at income. So it doesn't matter what profession they're in. You want to look at their income. Can they actually afford the rent that you're asking for? So the CMHC guidelines, I believe, is that 40% of your income should not exceed your rent. Is 40 or 50%? What is the guidelines for property ownership? Is it 42%? The TDS ratio? GDST? Um, what's the percentage? 32? Yeah, so same idea. It's between 30 and 40%. If you see a tenant can't afford the rent, don't rent it to them. Sorry, when I meant profession, I was talking about things like seasonal business, full time employment, those type of things. There's some uncertainty around the income. You yeah. might be making a lot of money, yeah. but if it tends to be seasonal, yeah. then that's a potential risk. Right? So we, we are in a contract environment. Right? Today, everybody is almost on contract. Almost very few people are on salary. Starting freelancing, essentially. Yeah. So a lot of people are doing contract work, right? And then when it comes to even salespeople, commission people, you have to base it, you really have to go on, on, on your gut with that. But I like to look at credit. Credit, income, affordability. If somebody can't afford the place, don't give it to them. Very simple. Just because you want your place rented out, if they can't afford it, don't rent it to them. All right? So to all my liberal friends, the Rental Fairness Act <laughs> was introduced by the liberal government that actually ha had the market change as well for real estate in terms of sales as well. So. If you, these are the new laws that were implemented. There's a bunch of other things. If you want to move back into your property, so a lot of clients say to me, well, let's just tell the tenants we're moving back into the property. They leave in two months, we rent the property. You can't do that. Big no-no. If you do that, you're, you're looking for trouble because you have to actually file an N-12, go to the tribunal, show up, and you have to prove that you're actually going to move in there. So that how you prove that is by actually showing up. If you do not move into that property, the tenant has a right to do an inspection on you or, or they'll find out if you have moved in or not. They can come back to you and you get to find up to $25,000. The new law says if you tell a tenant that you're moving back into the property, you have to give them the equivalent of one month's rent or find them a property. Okay, and find them a property means if you have another property, you move them back, you move them to another other property. Okay, um, so that goes on there. The new lease, so a lot of people have been, like, the, the leases that are out there, that are written up by realtors, and I, I'm a realtor, I'll be honest with you, they're all bogus. You cannot hold anyone to that piece of paper contract. Because the truth is that a tenant has a right, if your appliance, you know, we, I don't know if you've seen this, but you've seen this clause that says, tenant is responsible for the first $100 of any appliance repair, right? They'll sign off on it, just to get the place. Take, you have a repair on a client, they'll say, I'm not paying for it. Take me to court. Take me to tribunal. You can't enforce it. Okay? So the law is appliance breaks down, you're responsible. They're your appliances as a landlord. Okay? They're not the tenant's appliances. So you're responsible for almost every single repair in that property. Despite, I had a tenant that decided to put a plastic fork in a dishwasher. Okay? The fork broke got into the motor, damaged the motor. When a repair guy was in there and took out the motor and said, look, this is your, 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 um, your fork, he's like, that's not mine. Somebody else was here a year before me. Good argument. Had to buy a new motor, a new, a new dishwasher. So pick your battles, because by the time you get to tribunal for any sort of repair, uh, like small repairs, you're in for two, three thousand dollars Fix the bloody thing. It's that easier. Question. I mean, with all those horror stories. Yes. Um, in your experience, what's the percentage of times that you actually run into these issues? Like, can I, like, you know, is it like 10%, 20% of the time? It all comes down to how you screen your tenants. 
it really comes down to the screen your tenants. Our management firm, we manage about 200 properties. We have maybe one a year, and it's always for non-payment of rent, okay? The people that we get, the, the properties that we do go to the tribunal for are because they've either had a bad management company manage their property, or they've done it themselves and they put the wrong tenants, and we take over and we clean it up for them. Very, very expensive approach, but I always like to tell people is, don't get scared of tenants. They're actually good people. Tenants are good people. They actually want a good place to live in, but you have issues sometimes because you're not compliant. Because, excuse my language, is you're too cheap to repair something. So if you repair something, they're fine with it, right? But sometimes when you have multi-res, especially multi-res properties, when you're renting out properties that are $800, $700, $1,000, you have a lot of people there on disability, mental health issues. Like we took on a triplex right now for a client. Poor guy, I really feel bad for him. He put his tenant in, in the property seven years ago. He felt bad for her because she had no place to live, but she had every single excuse not to pay any single bill, yet he took her on. Now that there's a tenant downstairs in the basement, she doesn't like him, so she pours bleach in the toilet every single day. They took her to tribunal because of, of uh, unduly hard, uh, of damage. They couldn't evict her because the property management firm before her did not, uh, before, before, uh, before them, they did not record everything on time properly, and they did, not go, they did not go in accordance to the law and the timely issues. So what happened? They lost the case. Now we took it over, right? And now we're doing every, we're, we have a log and record of every single thing that happened. So we're just waiting six more months and she'll be out, right? So take care of your tenants because they're good people, but you'll always have damages and you have to paint your units at the end of your lease term, okay? People don't want to paint walls. They don't want to, why I like white walls is, is, is Mr. Is uh, that, what's that called? Eraser. The eraser, magic eraser cleaned everything. Right, so white walls are my favorite, but they're also the ones that get that are the dirtiest as well. So if you are a, a single unit investor, it is an expensive approach. But if you look at your return on investment over 10 years, 15 years, or 20 years of owning a property, you can make almost 100% return on your investment. I have a question on the rent increase, mm -hmm. uh, which is capped right now at 1.8%. This year it's 1.8%. Yeah, so is that something that? you can automatically increase year over year or is there some justification you have to go and uh, do and as well what's the is there what's the leeway to actually increase beyond 1.8% so 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 you can only increase up to the guidelines for all properties now okay and i encourage you to do that because if you have expenses are high hydro is expensive condo fees are getting expensive taxes are increasing so every year you want to increase the rent we have some tenants that are really good we don't want to increase the rents on but we always you know we, we play by ear um, and also affordability is an issue Sorry, going back to your question. You can only increase rent minimum once a year, once a calendar year, okay? Uh, what was your other question? The question is, if you did any major renovation, can you extend it, increase beyond one? It's no, still 1.8%. And that's based on the rent that's already been used previous year. Correct. Yeah, so if your rent was... It would be high anyway. Yes. Like too high anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Can you ask the tenant to buy their own insurance? Tenants, so we, we when we start our, our, our tenancy, all tenants must provide uh, their tenant insurance and they have to agree to, an on, to keep it ongoing. Before, tenants used to cancel after one year. Now, the truth is if a tenant cancels his insurance, which does happen often, you, can't, you can go to the tribunal to have them enforce their insurance, but at what cost? because it costs you money and you can't you won't recover it so at the end of the day if they don't have their own insurance if there's a fire or flood sol you know it's not your responsibility no if their property gets damaged because they canceled their policy it's fully their responsibility yeah any other questions thoughts there you go. That's your presentation for today. Thank you all for coming tonight. Really appreciate it. I want to thank RBC as well for letting us host this today. So thank you so much. For what? <laughs> I have my uh, I have my brochure. Uh, you can take a look at it. That is our full service package. If you want to know more about our services and what we provide, be happy to talk to you more about that. Yes, so if you got the, the blue, if you don't mind me just holding this up. If you got this, everything's in there. That's my office number. If you want to write my own personal cell number, I can give it to you. So let me know when you're ready and I'll give you my personal cell phone number. It's 416. 
274-1513. It's actually on my business card. So uh, no, I'll explain that. If you have any questions about our services, Rafiq, my friend and client, we'll be happy to answer you as a, I give, as a, as a reference and testament there. Um, for standard, uh, the standard package is basically leasing. So we charge one month's rent to find a tenant. Uh, if you go under our management program, uh, we do one month's rent to find the tenant. There's a one-time administration fee of $200 to set up all the banking and accounting. You get your own portal as well, so you can see all the reporting there, the work orders. We have to give a tenant uh, a statement every single month and an annual statement as well. Uh, so you'll see things in that portal there. And then our management fee is 7% of the rent. Per okay, month. Per, month. per month. Yeah, but, and everything's plus HST. Plus HST. Yeah. You can only get HST back is if you have a corporation, right, Vinod? Yeah. <laughs> is, that, is, that, is, that, is that a deductible expense? The HST is not, but all the fees are. The property fee, yeah. 7% that you pay is? Correct. And if, and if we do get a bad tenant, you can't represent them. So, when we, so what happens is that if you have uh, any cost, any uh, uh, landlord, uh, any tribunal cost, paralegal cost is on the owner. Any uh, repairs and maintenance cost is on the owner. We don't have a surcharge on any repairs or maintenance. That's why we charge 7%. So a lot of other companies have a surcharge or they have their own, it's a mom and pop shop, so mom and pop will go to the repairs and they make their money. We hire out every single handyman uh, and repair person. They're all bonded, they all have uh, insurance. We've learned the hard way not to go cheap. Uh, we prefer paying somebody the extra dollar to get the repair done on time. We typically have to turn units. So for example, July 1st, I have seven units that I need to turn over. That means I have to have, uh, my, my contractor has to have seven crews get units ready so the tenants can move in on the first, which is a holiday. So all these fees, you know, they cost money. So we hire professionals to do that. Um, so no surcharges on repairs or maintenance. Uh, you get all your reporting and accounting. Any, uh, we, we handle all the forms to tenants for you until we get to the landlord application. When it gets to a landlord application, uh, an L1 application, that cost, that, that's court cost, that's all uh, paid as uh, a charge back to you. Now, we, we, because we work very closely with our landlords and our owners, uh, they don't want to hire paralegals, so I'm happy to represent them, or happy to help them represent themselves in the tribunal process. Thank you.